Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Daum. This podcast is coming up on its three-year anniversary, which means there are some guests that have been here three times. One of them is author and critic William Derezowitz. Bill was first here in the fall of 2020, talking about his book, The Death of the Artist. He came back last summer to talk about his book of collected works, The End of Solitude. And I brought him in again now because I really liked a couple of recent articles he wrote about art, about artistic work, specifically how we experience it as audiences now, how it gets made now, and this question of whether culture has become boring or if it's just us, audiences, that are boring. We talk about everything from books to movies to dance, music. We also talk about a recent piece Bill wrote about artificial intelligence and why he thinks that despite all the fuss, AI will never be a substitute for human creativity. We talk also about his early career as a dance critic, about some of my recent experiences revisiting films that were important to me when I was younger, whether or not they held up. And Bill stays overtime to talk about that thing we cover in the bonus portion, how he feels about being the age that he is. That leads to some really interesting places, like how he feels about friendship, masculinity, regret, even the new gender movement. Got to shoehorn that in whenever possible. It's good stuff. So please join the Substack if you want to hear that part at megandown.substack.com. Become a paying subscriber. And in the meantime, here is my conversation for everyone with William Derezowitz. Bill, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back, Megan. This is your third visit here. You were here in the fall of 2020, I think talking about your book, The Death of the Artist. Has it been that long? That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Since since that book, yes. Yeah. Uh, You came back last summer to talk about your book of collected works, The End of Solitude. And I wanted to bring you back now to discuss a couple of recent essays you've published having to do with a lot of the stuff you wrote about uh, earlier, but really drilling down on the nature of creativity on a more fundamental level. One was in Tablet, and it's called We're All Bored of Culture. Um, And even seeing that title, I I winced a bit in in recognition. We're going to talk about several things, but I want to start by talking about this piece. And I, I have to say, I find myself sort of pathologically uninterested in things lately, but I usually attribute it to just being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of things, but you posit that culture is just uninteresting. <laughs> so I so I shouldn't feel so guilty is what you're saying. You, you shouldn't feel guilty. All all reactions are equally valid. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Are we done here? Um, Thank, thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what you're you're saying in the piece. I mean, that you you go a lot of places, but what what is your sort of basic premise? I do go a lot of places, and I recognize that, and I also recognize that there's a ton of culture being produced, and you know, plenty of it is good, plenty of it is interesting. I mean, I published this piece that they called, you know, why is culture boring, or we're all bored of culture, and of course, I got responses on Twitter and some emails saying, you know, well, it's obvious that you're just boring. I'm not bored. You know, look at this great piece of art that's being Mm -hmm. produced now. And I would say about half the time, the great piece of art that was being referred to was something created by the person who was tweeting at me. So, you know. Their own work? Like people are promoting their own work by... I know, it's it's shocking. Debating you on this? Okay, well, Well, that's a a new marketing strategy. But I also understand that, and I knew this as I was writing it, I I was worried about this as I was writing it, that there would be legitimate artists, uh, artists whose work I respect or would respect if I knew about it, who would feel slighted by this. And it's a very broad brush kind of argument. So I acknowledge that from the outset. But I don't think that I'm alone in feeling like culture has become just kind of okay. There's just like a ton of stuff out there that's just kind of okay. 
Uh, in fact, the piece was pitched to me by the editor of Tablet. And, you know, mm. I, so I'm, there are at least two people who feel that way, but I think there are a lot of people who feel that way. I think it's the feeling you get as you're scrolling endlessly through your, you know, Netflix, Netflix queue, trying to be inspired to watch something. Or, you know, you talked about being overwhelmed by the amount of content that's out there. It's just so, it's so hard to find something that's, that's, really, that, that's really teaching me something new or that's really exciting to read. I'm talking about opinion journalism, right? Like the, the avalanche of opinion journalism, the 30 pieces that the Times publishes every day. It's like you kind of poke through them like you're picking through a trash heap, looking, looking to find <laughs> that rare thing. I mean, yeah. maybe that may be an excessive metaphor. Uh, maybe it's more like going to a thrift store. Right, maybe oh, that's better. And it's not junk. Kind of it's just, smells musty. Yeah. yeah, it's just kind of dusty. It's just kind of nothing. Like you're, you know, you're looking for something that really turns you on. I almost wonder if, like, we're beginning to forget what that actually feels like. Like the thing that really makes you excited, that feels like an occasion. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, and I'm worried that you know we're both in our fifties, and is this just about being older? I was. I kept checking in with myself about whether that's true or not. But I, I often come back to the fact that, yeah, when we were younger and in the decades before we were younger, you know, works of art, uh, LPs that came out or, or books or movies, like they would sometimes feel like a, like a major occasion. Like the world would kind of come to a standstill because the Beatles just put out a new album or... I don't know, Scorsese. Wow, you're 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 really old. Okay. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't. I mean, I was a tiny child. I was a small okay. child when that happened. But I'm aware that it did happen. Right. But is it because it was an occasion? Like there was fewer to choose from. Like you knew that album was coming out. You went to the record store that day, and you waited. You saved up your money. I mean, you waited for a movie to come out. You waited for an art exhibit to come through town. So like, I mean, I struggle with this because I, I feel like I'm just missing something. Like there must be good stuff out there, but I'm just too lazy to seek it out. On the other hand, to your point, my podcast partner on my other podcast, Sarah Hader, who's 31, I think, she's not interested in anything. She thinks everything's boring. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there you go. Maybe it's she's not, right. It's nostalgia. And I yeah. take your point. I mean, is it just that there were fewer things and they were harder to get, uh, you know, you couldn't see the band except when they came through your town, right? You couldn't see them on YouTube or whatever. I'm still not convinced that that's true. I, 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 th I mean, I haven't talked to a lot of young people about this, granted. And everybody has their artists that they're really excited about, you know, Beyonce or whoever. But I, I do think that it is not the same kind of occasion, even in the life of an individual person. And it's not just about the fact that they're that they're rare. It's like I don't think that that's what stirs people. I think, to a great extent, po politics has has now assumed that role of the you know of the thing that sort of feels most vital to people, which, needless to say, is incredibly sad. Well, you talk about this in terms of what you call moral Calvinism. So explain what that means. And then I also want you to kind of take us through this timeline with, with postmodernism and right. stuff happening in the French cultural tradition, like sort of walk us through this. Right. I know it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a long tortuous argument. No, it's good. But actually. It I think it's really helpful. Things. Um, well, that's good. Yeah. You know, I was, I was inspired to think about this a lot by reading uh, the late, great Dave Hickey, who was this amazing writer and critic that I think I is not him. really well enough known. Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I think he's really one of the great writers of the last few decades, and certainly one of the great critical writers. And he wrote about everything, you know, music, uh, literature, and art was his main, the main thing he wrote about, visual art. And he talks about how art became institutionalized, how there was this, as he put it, kind of roughly a century where art escaped institutional bounds. So kind of the, there, were, there was the old guilds and the kind of state control that existed 
you know, before what we think of as modernity, you know, kind of in the age of church and king. And then, you know, sort of romanticism, modernism, many of the artists that certainly I look to as, you know, embodying the highest aspirations and the highest achievements in art, whether that's Picasso or James Joyce or Nijinsky or whomever. Um, that happened at a time when the old institutions no longer exerted, were able to exert formal, formal, I mean, often legal control over culture. And at the same time, this is, this is what my artist book is about, and I'm sure we talked about it, you know, three years ago. The capitalist marketplace, as much as people on the left and in the arts like to revile the role of the marketplace, the marketplace was incredibly liberating for art and actually for a lot of things because you no longer had to answer to church and crown. And you could give the audience what it wanted, but you could also teach the audience to want something new. You could find new audiences, new audiences developed, people developed. This is when art became a kind of secularized religion for the progressive or educated classes, you know, quote unquote, people like us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, art became, the artist became a kind of prophet or seer and people aspired, right? I mean, sometimes that aspiration could look silly, you know, sort of the middle class audience trying to be sophisticated. But I kind of respect that in a way. And I think it gave artists a lot of freedom to take chances and to uh, challenge the audience. I mean, that's become a cliche, but challenge the audience in a, in a, true, in a genuine way. Another great uh, late art critic, Robert Hughes, uh, called this the shock of the new. His term for modernism in the arts was the shock of the new. And it truly was shocking. I mean, new descending a staircase was truly shocking. Uh, the rite of spring was greeted with, with a riot, you know, when it premiered in it Paris. It tore the seats out of the, out yeah, of the concert yeah. hall. Yeah. This is what I mean by art really mattering to people. And Hickey talks about how gradually institutional control was reasserted. And he talks about it as kind of starting in the 20s and 30s and sort of one of his villains is Alfred Barr, who created the Museum of Modern Art. I think Hickey in this connection quotes Gertrude Stein, who said when she heard that there was going to be a Museum of Modern Art, she said, it can be a museum or it can be modern, but it can't be both. <laughs> I think, okay. we, yeah. But yeah, that's wrong. Well, but wait, so what are you saying? Because that's a, that's a very Gertrude Stein-esque thing to say. Well, but is I think, there anything I think, beneath that? Well, I think what she's saying is that once you put it in a museum, you've killed it. Oh, I see. Now, I don't oh, know that I... very I'm, punk rock. It's very punk rock. Hey, maybe Gertrude Stein was the birth of punk. I know. Oh, she was. I mean, yeah. as yeah. was John Cage, who you yes. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, right. People who were who were um, constitutionally and insistently anti-institutional. I mean, I started my life as an appreciator of art as a young adult with dance. I was a dance critic for 10 years. Fun fact. Oh, really? When I was in graduate school studying English Lit and actually even before. And my favorite person was Merce Cunningham. Mm-hmm. Who, I mean, even to the end of his career, there were a lot of people who would go see a Merce Cunningham show and think that it was a joke, you know? Uh, and what, because it was, it was, he never stopped being modern. He never stopped being radical. He never stopped, you know, pushing the boundaries. I mean, it's a cliche. But one thing about him is that he, it was always clear. I even took classes at the Cunningham studio. So I was kind of, I had a peripheral position from which to observe this milieu. And it was you took always, dance classes, actually? I did. I did. That's how in I ballet? got interested in dance. Or well, modern dance. Modern dance. Yeah, and I had taken ballet in college. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know. Different life. I'm 59 now. It's been a while since my last ballet class. Yeah. Yeah. It opened up a, a, an entire world for me. I mean, I wouldn't be doing, we wouldn't be having this conversation now if I hadn't done all that. Oh, that's fascinating. I had no yeah. idea. So, but, okay, but when but you're talking... Yeah, I, no, just, I just saw, just to finish the thought, uh, it was always clear that, the, that Cunningham's idea was that this company, which existed for over 60 years by the time he died, would, after he died, cease to exist, which is what happened. 
They did a final like two year world tour after his death. And then they, everybody just went their separate ways because the whole notion of institutionalizing Cunningham, the way Gr Martha Graham's work was institutionalized, there's still a Graham company, right? Uh, was inconceivable. That's, that's the point. You know, institutionalization is ossification. Institutionalization is death. Mm -hmm. And what we've got, and, you know, Hickey helped me bring this into even sharper focus, although I also wrote about it in The Death of the Artist, is that especially after World War II, there was this enormous institutionalization of art, including the creation of the MFA. Yes. It had, there were a few in the 30s, but basically we went from like eight to 150 to like 300 or 500 in both visual art and in creative writing. You're talking about MFA programs. MFA programs. Yeah, no, you write from 1940 to 1980, the number of institutions awarding graduate degrees in studio art increased from 11 to 147. And creative writing also had that kind of... Yes, kind of and the writing. numbers were comparable in creative writing. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Okay, but I'm but you're when you're talking about institutions, you're talking about universities, like just sort of arts entities. You also talk about like you write it's not that corporations have degraded popular taste, but it's the opposite. So I'm trying to understand like it's easy like at this point to look back and say, "Oh my gosh, it was so much better when corporations were like giving authors book advances and you know, like right. selling the selling right. art, having right. art auctions, and and right. you know, visual artists were getting paid. So, like, what's the uh, what's the least bad thing here? I guess is my question. Right, right. No, it, it, fair enough. So I talk about that institutionalization. Then I say that, and it's you know, I mean, it's a million things. It's foundations. It's residencies. So it's you know, Lincoln Center. I mean, people. A lot of people hated Lincoln Center. It's like well, we're going to have a supermarket for art for culture now. Um, the National oh Endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, which is mm -hmm. which you know was created in the '60s. So for Hickey, the answer was the market, right? It's the market that kind of brings our our dirty human desires into the realm of culture. Uh, but he was primarily an art critic, and he was primarily thinking about collectors of individual pieces. And so I go on to say, like, that's not how the market works in most. Fields. I mean, in, you know, in writing and in music, it's millions of people spending a few dollars on things. So it's a mass market. Mm -hmm. And again, without trying to be nostalgic, there was a time when the commercial side of the culture industry was composed of lots of relatively small entities, some of, some of whom, maybe just a few of whom, were really led by adventurous people who were doing it because they loved art like Maxwell Perkins at Scribner's who discovered Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Thomas Wolfe, or the rich guy who ran New Directions Press, which was the place that first published like Beckett and a lot of the sort of European modernist classics in the United States. Um, Ahmed Erdogan at, at Atlantic Records. Of course, all of those entities now, the names still exist, right? I mean, Scribner still exists, right? But it's part of what? It's part of Simon & Schuster, I think. Yeah, I think so. It's part of one of the giants. For our Strauss and Giroux, part of one of the giants. Atlantic Records is the, one of, there's now three major record labels. Right. So something happened in the commercial space as well, starting in the 70s, which was this massive corporate consolidation. Right. Right. And, but, okay. So, but as recently as the 90s, and I would argue the early aughts, there was still pretty interesting stuff getting made. The gatekeepers at those institutions were still sophisticated enough and interested enough in sort of decent material that you you did have great books being published and you had some great music being made and you know a, a film festival would have some really good programming, that sort of thing. And one of the things I've noticed, and I've written about this, it's the demise of the gatekeepers that's really influencing so much of this. The people who we used to kind of entrust with being arbiters of taste and showing us what was good, deciding to program their film festival with films based on their own kind of artistic sensibility and knowledge yeah. Yeah. of the medium. Um, those people have like fallen down on the job and we can talk about why. Yes. 
No, I think you're right. I, I agree with you. I mean, it, in some ways, I think the last really creative time in our culture was the 70s. But I certainly agree with you that there, there was still lots of interesting stuff happening, you know, indie music and indie film, you know, well, you know, through the 90s, for sure. Well, what's happened since the turn of the century? We know what's happened. The internet has happened. The internet has happened. And now wokeness has happened, which is, and these are synergistic. So yeah. it's what, I forget the name of the author, but I believe the book's called The Revolt of the Masses. The problem is now we really are getting what everybody wants. That's the problem. It's not that the culture industry is sort of bastardizing art and, you know, betraying us and corrupting our tastes. It's that it's actually feeding our taste back to us in an ever tighter feedback loop that's driven from the bottom. It's driven from the bottom, not from the gatekeepers and the tastemakers. It's driven from the platforms. Right, but nobody likes it. How is it happening that we're creating material that everybody actually, if not hates, is uninterested in, is bored by? Well, because, as you know, I said in this piece, the ultimate problem is that we are boring. Right. We're boring. And we might not want to acknowledge that, but that's what we are. We're boring. We're unadventurous. Most importantly, we could maybe talk about this too. We're lazy. Oh, I'm lazy. I don't think I'm boring, but I'm definitely lazy. Well, I don't think you're boring, but then I do think you're an artist. And I say, <laughs> the one kind of person who isn't boring is artists. And we need to, you know, the problem is we've, we've made it very difficult for, for artists to take the fact that they're not boring, create work that isn't boring, and then sustain a life that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to get yeah, to that yeah. in, in a little bit, but let me ask you this. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me throw this out here. Be honest. When is the last time you went to a movie in the movie theater? Oh, years ago. I mean, not just before, since before the pandemic, but before that. Yeah. But wait a sec. I mean, I agree. There's something that gets lost and I, and I understand that filmmakers complain and I sometimes feel like I wish I were seeing this in the theater if it weren't such a giant pain in the ass, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that that's more than just a, a small separate issue. Okay. Right? I, mean, I don't is know. It, is it because people aren't... I mean, if it is, you know what? You know why it's an issue? I mean, it's an aesthetic issue, of course. I think the real reason it's an issue is that when you go to the, the movie theater, I don't even know how much it is now. It must be like $15 a ticket or something. At least, and then by yes. the time you park, and, no. But I just and, mean the ticket, yeah, the park that's going to go up the that's going to go up the supply chain to the artist um, is fifteen dollars. Whereas if you watch, if you see it on Netflix, God knows they're making like three cents from it, mm -hmm. and that's the problem: is that there's no money in it anymore. That's part. Well, that's one of the problems: is that there's no money. And I know we talked about this before, and you talk about it a lot, as you should. But when is the last time you? even thought to yourself, oh, I should see that on a big screen? Um, well, I mean, I, I tend not to be interested in, you know, the stereotypical big screen movies, which are the ones with all the explosions. I remember, no, I'm not talking about Marvel movies. I'm talking I, about something okay. that would have, like, one, cinematography, meaningful one I, yeah. cinematography. One that I remember very vividly seeing, I don't remember how long before the pandemic is, but I think it was, it was called Uncut Gems, right? It was that yes, Adam I Sandler recently... Movie? I recently yeah. watched that film. And it was an amazing experience. And it would not have been the same experience uh, in my living room watching on a laptop. Because it's, uh, I mean, it builds this momentum. It becomes this kind of, thriller is the wrong word, but suspense. There's this tremendous suspense. And like, literally, I stood up, I was shaking, my palms were sweating, and I was afraid that I was going to punch the guy sitting behind me. Not for anything he had done, just like because I had so much adrenaline. Okay, that is fascinating because a friend suggested that I watch Uncut Gems and he recommended it so highly and was so enthusiastic about it and wanted me to watch it. And I watched it finally at home on my laptop and I thought it was good. I liked a lot <laughs> of things about it, but I found myself sort of irritated by it. I mean, I understand that the crosstalk and this, the, the, the tone of it and the, just the overall kind of um, just production vibe was very, very deliberate. A lot of artistic choices were made. I liked that a lot. But it didn't like, 
I certainly was not shaking and wanting to punch anybody other than yeah. my laptop, maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it was always going to be less of a movie for you than for me. Well, I kind of, I like this kind of movie, which is why it was recommended to me so highly. So, But it, but it may be because you watched it on your laptop and I watched it on a big screen. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm sure. for sure, for sure. But, but like I said, I mean, I think this is an interesting issue, but not really immediately germane to the main point. But what is germane is that you're, you're paying more in a theater. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think it is germane to the main point because I, I am trying to sort of these days do an inventory of the, at least the films that really were meaningful to me as a younger person and and wondering why that is. Were they really so great or was I just young and able to receive what we would now call content, I guess we were calling it art, in a different way? Like uh, I watched Paris, Texas the other day. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, 1984, Vim Vendor's film with uh, Harry Dean Stan and Dean Stockwell was a big, big, big deal. Big art house film in its time. And I don't know if you've seen it or how recently you've seen it. Many, many years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, it's something that you should watch on a big screen. It's sweeping landscape, very important cinematography. Sam Shepard, script. And I just couldn't, and I remember feeling very strongly about it at the time. It was a very important film for people who cared about film, which I did, even though I was probably 16, 17 when I saw it for the first time. I was like, this is really uneven. And I also was like, if there were some amazing moments, but then there were scenes that the dialogue just seemed incredibly stilted to the point where you wonder if it's on purpose, (laughs) Uh as if these characters are sort of like um, having an exchange. Like you're supposed to be watching this scene as if you are a child and watching adults speak to one another in this very stilted, formal, almost like in that sort of North Atlantic accent, is that what it's called? From the that actors used to speak in in like 30s and 40s movies. Like it oh, didn't Mid-Atlantic, feel realistic. Mid-Atlantic, maybe. Mid-Atlantic. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, right. Right. And I was like, is this I don't know what my point is exactly. Like I, I'm just taking Yeah, was stuff it really in. as good as you thought? Or exactly. was it just well, because you were 16? Right. But I think it is good. And then I went back and I read reviews and they were pretty much raves at the time. The film was like considered like revelatory and it was taken very seriously. So I don't know. I found myself wondering. However, I've also found myself thinking about it a lot in the in the days since I've seen it. So that I think tells you something. It sticks yeah. in your mind. If it yeah. stays with you, that tells you something. But I will say, I mean, aside from the fact that you were 16 and now we're in our 50s and Nothing is as vivid when you're in your 50s as everything was when you were 16, for sure. And also, the things you encounter, whether it's art or friends, have the potential to actually shape you and to shape the direction of your life because you're still, you know, wet clay. And right. now, you know, I'm hardened and like there's dust blowing off my surface. So oh, it's not the same don't thing. Don't say that about yourself. <laughs> but, but I also think that... Uh, Art always exists in its own time, and then it exists for other times. It exists, you know, for the people who come after it and look at it. And I think that art that 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 comes out now and that is contemporary to us has a a charge to it, or can have a charge to it that's specific to the fact that we are living in the same world. It feels, it can feel of the moment. It can feel like it captures the sense of being alive right at this moment, Mm -hmm. and. Time goes on and even a person, you know, even in the same life 40 years later, you're no longer in that moment. You're no longer feeling what it felt like, what you felt when you were 16. And now you're judging, I would say you're judging things a little more objectively. Obviously, objectively isn't the perfect word here because it's inherently subjective. But you're able, you know, now that that excitement of like nowness has been subtracted out and the work needs to stand or fall on other things. And maybe it, you know, it won't hold up. You know, people, that's the word, the phrase people always use. Does it hold up? Does it hold up? And maybe mm-hmm. it won't hold up quite the same. But of course, sometimes things do. And you can come across something for the first time that was created 300 years ago. And it 
can be the most incredible experience you've ever had. And that's what makes, I mean, there's no objective measure of quality in art. Right. To me, the best proxy is the most people for the longest amount of time have felt that this is valuable, have felt that this means something to them. And their pieces, their, their works of art like that. What is the effect of all of these master's degree programs in art? I mean, I know the short answer is bad, probably, uh, not a net positive. Uh, on the other hand, some really interesting people have come out of these programs. Yeah. Tell us more what your thinking is about that. You, you, you've written a lot about education, and this is very right. much in, in your wheelhouse. Right. So l l let's talk about this particular facet of education. You know, I think it's complicated. I think it's, e you know, the easy answer is they all suck and they homogenize you and they now, especially the amount of debt that people take on, it's totally inexcusable. I have a chapter in The Death of the Artist about this. I asked a lot of people about it. And some people had that attitude. And a lot of people said, you know, it can be a great thing. Um, maybe too many people go. Too many people go for the wrong reasons, like they can't think of anything else to do. But for the people for whom it's the right thing, it can be a great thing. Actually, one indie filmmaker who's now, or I shouldn't say now, at the time I talked to her six years ago, she had a debt of something like $225,000 and no hope of paying it off, but didn't regret it a minute of it because it's where she found her artistic voice. Oh. So I think it's complicated. And I also think at this point, I'm kind of thinking out loud, but I think at this point, so many people do it. It's like, where are you going to develop outside of that? Like, do the communities where people used to develop back when, you know, artists had contempt for people who got MFAs. Like this was true at least as late as the 70s. Like only idiots went and got painting degrees. You know, you went to New York and painted. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, people still did go to New York and paint. But I, I just, I, I don't have the feeling that those, that those communities are, are, are vibrant in the way they used to be. Well, it's definitely shifted al alongside political shifts. I talk to people who are in MFA programs now, and it's entirely about going along to get along. They're afraid to bring in certain material. They're afraid to critique certain students. It's, I mean, it's like a, it's a caricature of the kind of wokeness that, that we talk about. I have to say, when I was in MFA program in the early 90s, I really didn't feel that. I felt like if you were doing something new and weird and taking risks, th that was applauded. And in fact, I got ahead. I found my voice by just kind of allowing myself to lean into something that I hadn't thought was allowed previously. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know if you were following that whole scandal with Hobart uh, magazine oh my God. and Alex I Perez drank that the, up like a delicious milkshake. Exactly right. So I wrote about this on the Substack. I don't know if anybody's listening; they can go find that. But in a nutshell, let's see how did that go. So there was this literary magazine called Hobart that I had never heard of, right? Until then, neither did I. Yeah. And the editor, this uh, woman, I believe her name was Elizabeth Ellen, who's I guess she was a bit of a she's a bit of a renegade kind of transgressive literary figure. She had done an interview with this guy named Alex Perez, who was a Cuban-American, grew up in Miami, very working class, kind of scrappy background, ended up going to University of Iowa, writing program, most prestigious, you know, the usual sorts of suspects would be there. And he found that if he wrote about the men, particularly the kinds of men that he knew growing up, very, very sexist, very trash talking, very, you know, your, your typical, the, the kinds of people that Raymond Carver might have written about mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in some fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, he would bring in his work and it was just considered like too racist and misogynist for anybody to metabolize. And anyway, so he gave this interview with this magazine called Hobart. This was probably, but this was some last year sometime. Yeah, yeah. Basically just trashing 
everybody who goes through these programs and also just the the publishing establishment yeah, and basically nice saying it's the nice white ladies in Brooklyn who carry around their Hillary Clinton <laughs> tote, tote bags, bags. Yes. And, or, and cry, cry, cry when she lost. Right. It was a del- I, I think I said something like uh, when I, when I read the interview, uh, I, I didn't necessarily. I thought it was a little unhinged, and I didn't necessarily think it was all on point. But I, I wanted to have sex with the interview. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I mean, he was. He's he's basically right. He is right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think. Yeah, I think that I actually was just corresponding last week with somebody I know who is a teacher at an art school that I won't name. Uh, It's the same school he went to in the 70s. He's been teaching there for several decades. And it was incredibly sad and angry. He actually sent me a a couple of long voice memos about it and just a couple of very sad and angry monologues about what's happened to his school. And I know from people, from other people I've talked to have happened across art schools. Institutions can be, and I'll, I'll say more about that, I, I just, institutions can be the um, application point of, of social control, right? It can be the place, like you just described, like everybody has to be super woke, everybody's walking on eggshells in MFA writing programs. It is a place, of course, Twitter also is very good at exerting social control, but in the intimate setting of, a, of, an, inst- of an academic institution, you know, those norms can be exerted very powerfully. So it can be like a norming environment, an environment where everybody gets aligned. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, he described a school that he went to in the 70s where, like you said about your program in the 90s, people felt tremendous freedom. I like to say that the purpose of school at any level is to bring students together with good teachers and then to get out of the way. Mm-hmm. But what he described to me, and again, this chimed with stuff I've heard about many, many, many schools, art schools and otherwise, is that there's, and you know this, there are more and more layers of bureaucracy have been inserted between and around the student-teacher relationship. And schools, I think even I don't, uh, I'm not even aware enough of this, the extent to which higher education has become so managerialized. I mean, people talk about the corporate university. And one of the things that means, one of the big things, is that the management of practices and principles of corporations have been brought into universities, often by people who have degrees in in educational administration. Like, that's a thing now. Like, you get a master's degree in educational administration, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're like 28 years old or you're 35 years old, and you are getting to tell professors what to do. Like, maybe, you, you know, you're not telling them what courses to teach, but you are promulgating all of those guidelines, all of the diversity guidelines, all of the, you know, treat students with kid gloves guidelines. Right. In order to justify your job. Okay. In order, but in order why did, why did that come about? Do you know the answer? Like what drove this? God, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, and I'm going to give an unsatisfying answer, but, you, you know, you may, you may well be aware of uh, David Graeber, another late great thinker, right? He was an anthropologist, a social thinker. He died young. He was 59. Graeber, G-R-A-E-B-E-R. Mm-hmm. He was an anthropologist. He wrote, he wrote a lot of books. A couple of his books are about bureaucracy. There's one called Utopia of Rules and one that people might have heard of called Bullshit Jobs. Oh, yeah. I think it got a certain amount of attention, maybe because of the title, and I and which was kind of a continuation of Utopia of Rules, because bullshit jobs are jobs in bureaucracies. They're they're box checking jobs. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that Graeber says is that the way that bureaucrats increase their power is by putting more people under them. Direct reports in the ma- in the language of organizational charts. In other words, bureaucracy has a tendency to grow by itself. It has a tendency to expansion. Because bureaucrats become more powerful by having more bureaucrats under them, which is not true of professors or writers, right? I mean, you know, there's no natural tendency to grow. A department might want to get bigger, but it it doesn't, you know, there's no imperative for it. So I think it's just, 
once the bureaucracy became strong enough to run the university for its own benefit, because obviously there had been some level of bureaucracy, what it wants is more bureaucracy. So, you know, the statistics are that like, I don't know, the faculty has grown by, I'm going to make these numbers up, but they're sort of rough. You know, I've, I've seen numbers like this. The bureaucracy over a certain period of time, the faculty over a certain period of time has grown by like 50% and the bureaucracy has grown by 200%. That our teacher that I just mentioned said that he went to his school and when he went to school in the seventies, there was like maybe four administrators. It's a small school, you know, just enough to, you know, I don't know, pay the light bill. And now there are hordes of them, and there are all these offices of this and, 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 you know, committees of that. But is that because there's a perfect storm between baby boomers raising a certain kind of kid, uh, an anxiety about global competition that's, like, so much harder to get into college now because you're competing with the whole world, and then also the, the rise of these social sciences, these little departments that, like, have to kind of justify their existence every day by inventing new ways to problematize things. Like, you know what I mean? It just seems like everything kind of coalesced, like a whole bunch of, whole bunch of phenomena that could have been like fairly benign sort of came together at a certain point and just created this total just sludge stew right. of stupidity. Right. right. Um, yeah. So, I, a couple things. A lot of the bureaucrats are like diversity and like hand holding bureaucrats. I think a lot of them aren't. I think they're bureaucrats sort of, you know, in every imaginable direction in a university. But I'm not sure that you're saying this, but certainly other people have said, this is not my original idea, that the whole diversity bureaucracy, whether it's at universities or corporations, is a jobs program. It's a jobs program for people with social science and humanities degrees, right? Like, what do you do with your grievance study degree? Well, now there's something you can do. You can go yeah. be a grievance promoter. Right. But that right. just because those people exist doesn't mean they're automatically going to get jobs. And I, you know, like you said, there's a perfect storm and we, we have to throw the internet in because it's through Twitter that this, not maybe not just Twitter, it's through the platforms that this, that this demand has really gotten exerted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so uh, what is your feeling just about the TikTok artist, the YouTube artist, the content creator versus the quote unquote real artist? Because this is again, an area where I feel like I have to check myself. Like I roll my eyes. I hate that stuff. I don't want to watch something on my phone. I don't like it. I don't think these are real artists. On the other hand, there are people doing incredible work that happen to be showing it on a YouTube channel. There are incredible musicians out there and they are on TikTok. <laughs> okay. I don't know what my question is really. Like, do you think that we just need to like get with a program and understand that the format has changed, the platforms have changed and that's just no, there's no going back. Yeah, I heard there are a lot of reality TV shows that are also really deep and meaningful artistic. Oh, no, look, I mean, okay. yes, you're, yes, you're, no. I don't watch those. Yes, ever. no, I'm, I mean, yes, you're right that we need to also pay attention to that. That, you know, there's nothing world in the worst than worse than the world having passed you by. But at a certain point, that happens and you're no longer living in your world and you need to acknowledge that. But I also don't think it's that simple. There's nothing. I think inherent in any new medium that means it's not capable of, of being used to produce great art, you know, and, and I'm sure that people are doing great art using, you know, new, you know, digital platforms, blah, 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 maybe even TikTok. Although it seems like a very narrow container. I've never gone on TikTok. I, speaking of narrow, I just don't like the layout. I don't like that vertical rectangle. Uh -huh. It stresses me out just looking <laughs> at it. Yeah. Yeah. I've been on like once or twice just to, for some specific reason. I mean, but you know what I, I mean? Like I'm saying, like, I mean, I could see, you know, t Twitter being used. I mean, people were trying to use it as a, as a certain point in a serious way. Maybe some people still are, you know, it, to, 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 I mean, you know, the very fact that it's a small container, you know, you know, you're dancing in chains is the cliche, right? So you're putting these, these, very narrow constraints on yourself as an artist, and that forces you to be inventive and do interesting things. That is certainly possible and probably happening to some extent in all of those media. The question is, 
you know, what are most people consuming through that media, through those media? Like, what is it doing to culture in general? And just, just because somebody's creating something and calling it art doesn't mean it's art. And it certainly doesn't mean that it's any good. And it doesn't mean that we're just being old by saying it's crap. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, um, So, and and, and like you said before, it's not even art anymore. That's not even the word people use. It's content. And content is something that you think about in a different way and that you consume in a different way. And it's designed to be consumed very quickly and once, right? I take it that's how TikTok works, right? The idea is to keep feeding you, develop an addiction. So you're addicted to one particular influencer's stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go back? And watch something they did three months ago because it was such a magnificent work of art and you want to see if it holds up. It's not even the intention. Right. I'm not, yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about like TikTok videos so much. I'm thinking of musicians. I mean, there are serious musicians out there. There are there are bands that ha- that do, you know, complicated material, that compose material, that have, you know, 20, the 20 players in them that are that are mostly getting their material across on YouTube. I mean, that doesn't mean that they don't tour. That doesn't mean you can't go see them in concert, but like, that's how I would discover them for instance. Well, but that's Um, different. That's just a matter of distribution. And, and, you know, I mean, you know, you can just, you can read Dostoevsky, uh, you know, on, on a, on a Kindle. It doesn't mean it's not Dostoevsky. It's just, it's just the way it's being delivered to you. Right. Okay. The issue is when those when the when the medium really starts when the platforms start to shape what's produced. Yeah. Okay. Well, and speaking of that, that's a great segue to what I want to talk to you about next, which is a recent piece you had in Persuasion oh, about yes. AI. Yes. But why AI will never rival human creativity. I don't understand AI. I'm the latest adopter. Like I had a BlackBerry phone until the last possible second. So I'm trying to even figure out how to start thinking and talking about AI. I'd like to talk about it more on this show. But talk to us about this piece. Uh, You start out by saying AI might put artists out of business. It will not, however, replace them. Yeah. I know this is really... A risky, and it's the kind of thing that can look foolish very quickly. I, I acknowledge, and I think I even said that. And so I just want to start by saying that. Um, and also, I mean, I'm already so bored with people talking about AI. I hate being hectored. There's so much hectoring going on. It's going to change everything. Mm. You're already obsolete. We're going to be new humans. Like, I mean, I you know, I mean, how many hype cycles do we have to go through before we? Okay, so I I really can't even stand listening to people talk about this. But I really just make, it's a fairly short piece, and I really just make one simple point, which is that as I understand it, and I definitely do not have a deep understanding, but my superficial understanding, based on hearing people who do have a deep understanding talk about it, is that these are programs that basically, they're autocomplete, right? They're super sophisticated versions of what's the most likely next word. Like, that's how a chat but works. So they're making high probability choices. That's what they're designed to do. They ingest an enormous amount of you know, textual material in the case of a chatbot. And they're using their algorithm to figure out what, you know, what is the, and that's how they can mimic human output. And that's how they can, I mean, it's, you know, we've learned, I mean, it's, I love the college essays that they've been producing because they're so perfectly hideous, right? They're like a perfect <laughs> version of a crappy college essay. They're the perfect version of the kind of college essay that's written robotically by an actual human with no, with no spark or individuality. So high probability choices. My point is art is a series of low probability choices and creativity more broadly is a low probability choice, right? It looks like it, you do something that looks wrong. You do something that looks wrong even looks like a mistake, may even be in the process of a creation, a mistake uh, that you recognize a minute later or the next day was actually a fortuitous mistake. And you end up producing something that isn't, quote unquote, what art is supposed to look like. Cubism wasn't what art was supposed to look like. Now we've gotten used to it, so it is what art is supposed to look like. Uh, And I point out that some of the, the great breakthroughs in art, including, and I mentioned Merce Cunningham, were seen originally and sometimes still seen as not even bad. They're seen as not even art. 
it's like, it's not music, it's noise. It's not painting, it's something my five-year-old can do. You know, Cunningham's work isn't dance. There's no, it's not set to music. It's not telling a story. This is not what dance is supposed to look like. So I don't understand how an algorithm can ever do that. Because it's preci- it's precisely doing something that's not only never been done before, but doesn't look like anything that's ever been done before. So how can you predict? How can it be created through a predictive process? Well, can it uh, create stuff that's predictable in the first place? I mean, I guess it depends on how you define art. Again, this is not something that I follow, but I guess this there's this Drake, like an AI was able to like completely just stimulate the music of Drake and nobody could tell the difference. <laughs> but you see, this is what's interesting, right? But, the, it, I'm sorry, am I interrupting you? No, please do, because I don't know anything more. I had, oh, I mean, <laughs> I had this nothing is what more you to always say. Hear. This is what you always hear. They, it made a song that sounds like Drake. It made a painting that looks like Rembrandt. By the way, it doesn't look like Rembrandt, but okay, let's even stipulate that it does. It produced a passage of text that sounds like Wittgenstein. Again, actually, it's not doesn't sound like Wittgenstein, but let's pretend that it does. But Drake didn't create his music by trying to imitate somebody else, right? The point is not to be able to make Drake or Rembrandt or Wittgenstein. The point is to be the next Drake or Rembrandt or Wittgenstein, to do the new thing that doesn't have a name yet. That's the point. I mean, the truth is, I may be wrong, but I assume that a talented artist could also, I mean, this is what forgery is. There are, I think, Vermeer forgeries that were famous. You know, a talented artist, once they know what a Vermeer looks like, can produce a passable Vermeer. Mm -hmm. The problem, it's much, much, much harder and rarer to produce something that's as good as Vermeer, but is entirely a new thing. You know, like what Picasso did. Right. That's what's hard. Yes. So, but the the thing is people need to be able to appreciate the new. Yes. I think they yes. can't even take it in because I think it's too exhausting to use the phrase du jour. Like it's easier to listen to a Taylor Swift song and then a simulacrum of a Taylor Swift song than to take in some contemporary equivalent of to cite your example, the 42nd chord at the end of the Beatles, A Day in the yeah. Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, this gets back to the, to the other essay that we were talking about and the way I ended that essay. You know, we touched on this earlier where I say, like, we civilians, we non-artists can't help being boring, but we can help being lazy. And I feel like, again, there was no golden age. I'm not trying to be nostalgic, but I, I do think there, was, there have been times even recent times, where the audience or enough of the audience asked more of itself, wanted, again, I talked about aspiration, like aspired to understand something that was difficult. And yes, there may have been a lot of pretentiousness about it, blah, blah, blah. American college students in the 70s and 80s going to European art house films. But that was, there was, but you know what? There was also something real about it. Yeah. See, I make fun. Now I cringe at the thought of myself with doing that. I think, yeah, see, but there was nothing better in the 70s and the 80s. Well, in the 70s, I was a kid, but in the 80s and the early 90s, going to the European art house film. I And listen, saying listen, very pretentious yeah. things about it with your friends yes. after, while smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. Yeah, you know, and, and yes, and there was something pretentious about it, but that doesn't mean that there also wasn't something valuable about it. And I wonder if you or I Actually, I don't even wonder. I shouldn't speak for you. I wouldn't be the person I am if I hadn't challenged myself that way, even if some of the reasons I was doing it were social. Oh, yeah, Um, no, totally. You know, the art house or the difficult modernist literature or difficult philosophy or whatever it is. I mean, who would we be if we confined ourselves to a diet of pop culture? Well, some would say we would be more commercially successful. Producing crappy pop culture. Yes, we would be doing that. I wouldn't have wanted to write at all if that's. I all wouldn't I'd have been either. I wouldn't to. have either. I could never see. The thing is, I can't go back and say like, oh, why, why, why didn't I pursue this or that? Because I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, I was inspired by those things to right. try to, to to try to also um, push myself in my own work. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, you know, it's hard, but it's not valuable if it's not hard. 
But when, well, I'm just trying to pinpoint, like, when was the moment where it really stopped being possible to do something that was challenging or just different? Okay, part of my, my, my project to go back and revisit some things that were meaningful to me. So I watched the first couple episodes of Girls the other night, mm-hmm. Lena Adams' <laughs> Girls. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a big fan of hers. I think she's brilliant. Uh, I know she's polarizing, but I'm I'm a cheerleader for her. Uh, and I thought Girls was brilliant at the time. I rewatched it. It's fantastic. It's absolutely artful. It is funny. It is dark. It's just flawless. At least the first couple episodes. They it started in 2012. And so, you know, I know I know you and I have talked about this. I feel like the the year that we kind of pinpoint as when everything started to fall off the side of the cliff was like 2014. I wonder if 2012 was the last year a show like Girls could have gotten any kind of footing. I think it depends what you mean. Um I I thought the first at least the first couple of seasons of Girls was terrific. I I thought it really kind of went downhill after that, but we don't need to talk about it. Okay. I think that there was that time kind of in the early streaming era where there was a lot of really great, especially a kind of a tourist comedy, you know, the yes. Louis and yes. Pamela Adlon's Better Things and uh, Maria Banford had Lady Dynamite. Yes. And, a tourist, and exactly. About, yes. Yeah. And they talk about, I mean, you know, Netflix started to look at the numbers and realize it wasn't worth paying for all this stuff. But look, I mean, I think Barry's a great show. Maybe I haven't seen it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what you think of it. It's kind of silly to compare it to girls because it's a very different kind of show. I think Succession is a great show. Of course, I think those are both HBO shows, or at least Succession is, and HBO is HBO. But, but so, so my point is, again, it's not like a blanket statement, like nothing good is being created um, whether that's a television show or some obscure painter working in some small city. I mean, undoubtedly, good and even great stuff is being created. I just think the conditions are so hostile to it now. And I also think that, I think I said this, um, like, I think it used to be the case that when somebody, you know, whether it's the Beatles or Merce Cunningham or Picasso or whatever, did something very original and it was brought into the mainstream to the, to the attention of the mainstream. It dragged the mainstream a little bit in its direction. Maybe in the case of the Beatles, it was a lot. And now my sense is that if the, anything that the spotlight gets turned on just withers, it just gets, if it's going to survive in the mainstream, it's going to have to become content. It's going to have to become commercialized and, and, and digestible and palatable. And it will be ganged up on. That's the thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like, I always, I always talk about that famous Nora Ephron quote about like, you know, owning your experience. Like if you, if you slip on a banana peel, you're a fool. If you tell the story of how you slipped on a banana peel, you're the hero, right? If you're the raconteur, you, you own the story, but now the, the crowd puts the banana, banana peel down for you. Yes. You know, <laughs> puts the banana peel the, down for you. Yeah, yeah the crowd, the yeah. audience puts the banana peel down on the ground and waits for you to slip on it. Yeah. And yeah. that's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm also curious what you think about critics, the role of critics, that kind of, um, again, the, the, the gatekeeper, the person that we trust to have the taste and the knowledge to tell us what we should like. I mean, that was really important. People used to care about critics a lot. I mean, Pauline Kale was like deeply important to me (laughs) for a long time. And uh, Anthony Lane is still writing in The New Yorker, uh, except I never read him anymore. I'm not sure why. Yeah. um, I became a critic because I thought criticism was important to people. (laughs) I managed to outlive that, that time in the world. Um, the New Yorker's dance critic was called Arlene Croce, and she, you know, um, I was obsessed with her writing and and inspired by it. And 
it was very important in that world. And we can think of examples in, in any field. I mean, it sounds like we keep hitting the same note, but, and, and I could be wrong, but I don't have a sense that critics are particularly important to people anymore. And what I think people don't understand about criticism is that, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is hack work and a lot of it is just kind of um, reaffirming the consensus and, you know, it seems to exist to smother originality. But a really good critic, Arlene Croce is an example, and I, I don't know if Kale was an example, I assume she was. They can champion the new difficult avant-garde work. Yes. And they were yes, shepherding I, it along. They were helping us to understand it. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, that's what Clement Greenberg was doing, right? That's right. That's right. With with abstract expressionism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, lots of examples. I mean, the critics who rescued Herman Melville from obscurity, the critics who elevated Jane Austen from just being kind of a, you know, a, a woman writer not to be taken seriously to you know, in the first rank of English novelists. Lots, lots and lots of examples. But if, but if nobody cares about criticism anymore, or if people are writing the kind of criticism, I mean, there's so much awful criticism now. I mean, it's, it's, oh my God, and it's, it's moral policing. I cannot believe the cultural criticism that I read in once great media outlets that are basically just like, this story should not be told because this marginalized person has a bad experience. Or it's it's astonishing. Yes. Like you yes. cannot make it up. Yes. Or this is something by a, a black person portraying the black experience, but I, as a black person, don't like the way this black person portrayed the black experience because it's right, the right. Way. You're the wrong kind of black person. Yeah, this is yes. the wrong kind of experience. Well, that's no, what I happened mean, to uh, what's his name, Alex Perez, right? The, the Hobart guy. That's exactly oh yeah. Well, what he, he, what he said is, his problem was right. I just I find it just remarkable that places like The Cut and The New Republic go down the list, the critics just, it just seems like they're there to tell people what they're supposed to like for political reasons. Yeah, And it has nothing yeah. to do with any kind of aesthetic experience or anything transcendent. It's anti-art. I thought uh, Emily Nussbaum was sort of the last great, maybe not yeah. the last great, but she reminded me of Croce and Kale. The New Yorker TV critic, and it seems like oh, she's I know, I know seated. Emily. Yeah, no, she's, well, a, you know, she's I'm a friend. To, to the audience, to the people who may not remember, who might not. My audience uh, knows who Emily Nussbaum, Emily Nussbaum is. Now. <laughs> she was, I mean, she really, she was like a real throwback experience for me. That kind of directness, as yeah. well as the kind of direct personal voice, as well as like total knowledge, comprehensive knowledge of the medium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she left the position for whatever reason, and I feel like the people who've well, she won a Pulitzer. Everybody. Yeah, and she and and she also was not pretentious. Like she was able to right. say, "Here's why right. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is great." Yeah, yeah. But and that takes a level of fearlessness that a lot of people don't have. But yeah, I think I may have said this to you before, but when she was on Fresh Air, Terry Gross said that asked her whether, uh, as a feminist, it's hard for her to criticize things. <laughs> that are made by women. <laughs> and Emily Nussbaum beautifully said, I think the most feminist thing you can do is to is be honest about your responses. Oh, Terry, Terry. That's not a belief. That's not an article of faith anymore. That the most, the best thing you can do is be honest about your responses. I think the best thing you can do now is to be dishonest about your responses. Well, that's what the people most, expect. Most politic thing you can do. But I just, yeah. I keep coming back to, this idea of trusting your audience. I mean, I love how you uh, quote, you, you mentioned Fran Leibowitz in the, in the tablet piece. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of the Martin Scorsese film, uh, public speaking that, yeah, uh, that's, that he made I about her. I think it's from that. that. Yes, yes. That's one of my favorite films. Uh, and I have shown it to students many times just because I want them to see what it's like for somebody to just be completely unapologetic in their opinion, mm. like Fran Lebowitz just says something and she just slams it down and she could be dead wrong. I mean, most of what she says in that film is right, but some of it's completely wrong <laughs> and she just owns it. But it, it, that moment where she talks about connoisseurship and audiences that not only appreciated like the opera or the ballet, but understood it and knew the pieces, knew the works, knew the compositions, knew the choreography in such granular detail that they were sustaining yeah. the arts just 
through just yeah. through sheer enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. The the audience for Balanchine yes. in New York in the fifties and sixties. That's right. That's exactly the kind of voting she was talking about. And you're making me realize that one idea that's kind of popped up a few times in our conversation, maybe we didn't put it exactly like this, is confidence. People who have yeah. confidence in their own judgments, whether those people are gatekeepers or you know, editors or running a record label or, or, or the audience, a member of the audience, or Emily Nussbaum. It's like, this is my response. I stand on the authority of my response. Mm-hmm. This, yeah. it's, it's, you know. Well, it's your um, job. You're doing your job. If, you, if your job is to be a critic for The New Yorker, do your job and stand on your response. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also saying it's the job of, of the audience member. I mean, ideally, this is what this is what we who are, you know, absorbing art, this is how we can really we instead of looking around and, and seeing whether this is the correct response, either for contemporary political reasons or, you know, back when we were college students, you know, watching art movies and like you're supposed to love the Fassbinder, whatever it is, like if you don't love it, say you don't love it. Yeah. Or if you love something that other people think is stupid you know, stick by it. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of things I think are stupid. I, I really keep coming back to this idea of trusting your audience because I think people lose, artists lose faith in their own audiences. We talk about audience capture where people are just, the feedback loop, as you speak of, they're just feeding their audience what they want because the audience is paying them directly. But even aside from that, I think you have to trust your audience to get what you mean. <laughs> to yeah. get where you're coming from. And instead of just larding whatever you're doing with a million equivocations and, well, you know, to be sure, I don't mean this. I'm about to say something, but I don't mean it this way. Just yeah. say it. I, I think people have lost faith in the intelligence of their own readers and 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 listeners or whatever it is. And 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 I have found that anytime I have sat down with the attitude of like, I'm going to say something and I'm going to write it to the people who will get it. And I don't care about the people who don't get it. Those pieces always turn out better than the ones where I'm trying to just like satisfy a larger pool of readers. And they're probably the ones that people are the most grateful for. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course you're, you, you're, I, I don't know if you're only thinking now about stuff that you're publishing on your Substack, but no, if you are, I don't think I don't publish enough on the Substack to think well, about it I, that much. I, just because the point I was going to make was like, there's one thing, you know, is what is what you your willingness to trust your audience, but then if you're working with an editor, they have to be willing to trust their audience. Well, and you, I know that's the problem. Is I used to I used to trust my editors to trust the audience, yeah. and then suddenly the editors got started getting in the way. And that's really sad because a lot of them, you know, they know better. It's the same people, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same people who were, who were getting you and, and making your work better. And now they're just obstructing it. Yeah. I I have to say, I mean, um, I think about Leon Weaseltier who I wrote for at the New Republic. Yes, and now he, I write he's been a guest on, on, here, on this show. Yeah, yes. yeah. And I think, I think ultimately what makes Leon a great editor is that he trusts himself and he, and he trusts his audience. He trusts yeah. his own taste and he has respect for his audience. Yeah. But well, there aren't a yeah. lot of people like that. No. Well, he's the original uh, he's DGAF. No yeah. He does not give a fuck. Yes. Well, before we go to the bonus, I want to ask you something. This is shifting slightly, but not too much. This is an education question. You've written a lot about higher education. Your book, Excellent Sheep, was about the college experience. Do you think that college has, I'm not going to say any value anymore, but do you think it has lost so much value that people should really seriously consider whether they even need to go? Yeah. Um, I think that's complicated. Um, sorry if I've been saying that too much, but I mean, first of all, there is the credentialing issue and that's a big issue, right? Like there are many jobs still, even though there's kind of pushback against it. You know, I think the governor of Pennsylvania said that like 
you know, lots of state jobs no longer need a college degree. Great. But there's still tons of jobs which, right or wrong, require a college degree. Um, also, if we imagine, you know, someone not going to college and still being able to self-educate, I think in Excellent Chief, I also there mentioned Fran Leibowitz because I think in that same movie, which I guess you've now seen 25 times, so you yes. must know very well, she says that she dropped out of high school. High school. Because she didn't yeah. have enough time to read. She wanted more time to read. <laughs> no. Maybe she, she said that somewhere else. She would read in class, but a, an unrelated book. Yes. And okay. they would throw her out of the class. There you go. Well, listen, I don't know a lot of high school dropouts, and I probably don't even know a lot of people with high school-only educations. But my guess is that probably very few of them are like Fred Leibowitz or, you know, any kind of autodidact whom you've met who really has managed to give themselves an education. In other words, if you think college is bad, would try not going to college. Well, but we're talking about the humanities because, again, I know Sarah Hader, my my 31-year-old podcast partner, she's been a very useful metric because, like, she's coming from a place now where she just thinks that everything is has become bullshit. Like she thinks there's really no, that, that if you send your kid to college at this point, they are more than likely going to get taught a bunch of stuff that's not only not useful in the real world, but actually dogmatic to the point of dangerousness. Yeah. Um, I, I, I listen to your podcast. I listen to that other podcast. Um, I listen to every episode. I think Sarah's really smart. I think, again, to say that is to make the mistake of thinking that most American higher education is the stuff that we read about in the Times, that it's mostly elite liberal arts colleges where students are majoring in something with the word studies in the name. Mm -hmm. And that's really a pretty small fraction of the whole thing. I hope, but it's, but it's infecting those. I mean, it's, in, it's in, in engineering departments now. It's in medical schools now. No, it's true. It's true. But again, what's the alternative? I mean, where are you going to learn how to be an engineer? YouTube you videos. Learn? You could go to medical school just watching YouTube videos now. Right. But you know that you're making a joke. And so most people are going, they're not, they're not majoring in the humanities. That's like 7% now. Or even the social sciences, right? They're majoring in something STEMI or vocational, you know, nursing, business, whatever. Um, and a lot of them are are not from upper middle class backgrounds where they're going to have cultural capital and social connections that are going to enable them to reproduce their parents' standard of living or something close to it. I mean, this is, you know, for all of its flaws, I mean, American higher education, which is overwhelmingly public, really still is a leg up for a lot of people. I mean, like 40% of college students go to community colleges. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, I mean, there are all kinds of fucked up things for sure. I mean political stuff and the debt and the bureaucracy, I think people will toss out, do you really need to go to college? But they tend to be people who went to college. And I kind of wonder if they really wouldn't go to college if they had the choice. to. Right. Or to their parents went to college. If, if your parents went to college, maybe you don't need to go to college as much as somebody whose parents did not go to college. You know? Well, maybe. I think it depends what you want to do. Like if you've got books in the house, yeah, obviously depends on what you want to do. But I mean, I mean, it's hard enough to get people in college to read books. Right. I'm just saying a sort of like a if you grow up in an environment where I learning right. and education right. is valued right. and you have exposure to to culture and to ideas. Right. And you know how to talk and you know how to talk to people and you know how to absorb information and have opinions and form thoughts like that's if you grow up in that kind of family if you don't go to college i can see how you could continue to function pretty well fair but enough if you grow up in a family with none with none of that right. if you're an immigrant right. who knows if you're you know lower class you're going to have stepping into and even a community college is going to be stepping into an entirely new world that you're going to be elevated just by virtue of being there for a week. No, absolutely. But, but again, I mean, not just to harp on it, like even that first scenario where you grew up with books and, and all that stuff, like it depends what you're going to want to do with your life. Like if you want to go into business, 
or maybe, I mean, yeah, you want to go into business, it's probably good to just go right in and save, save the time and money. But if you want to, if you want a job in the media, the first question you're going to ask is, where'd you go to college? Yeah, well, but that's the problem, see. I agree. I agree. <laughs> that's a because problem with the media. if the answer isn't brown, they still won't hire you, even if you did go to college. And that's fucked up. But you can't tell to, you know, you can't, the kid can't say, well, you know, the whole employment landscape needs to reform itself so that these jobs don't require college. The kid needs to act in the landscape that exists now. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're giving do. a pragmatic answer. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Right. So Sarah's thinking about this on a hypothetical level. I say, there's no way you're not sending your kids to college. And she says, well, that's not, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I it's far that. enough and in the future for her. Yeah. We yeah. can check back. Yeah. But no, I think on a practical level, you're right. All right. Well, I want I want to keep you for some overtime and I'm going to sure. ask you about a number of things, in, including if there's any, you know, what you would do differently. Because I always go back and I think I would go to a different college. And the, this, the, the regret column is uh, kind of building up a little bit. But we're going to talk about how you feel about being the age that you are, which you're going to reveal. But in the meantime, thank you again, Bill DeResowitz, for coming on on the podcast and writing these pieces. They're really great. I'm always thrilled to see your byline and oh, happy to have you here. Oh, it's always fun to be here. Thank you. That was my conversation with William Derezowitz. He is an award-winning essayist and critic and the author of the best-selling book, Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite and the Way to a Meaningful Life. His other books include The Death of the Artist and The End of Solitude, Selected Essays, on culture and society. He's been on this podcast three times now. So uh, you can go back and hear him from the fall of 2020. And also, I think it was last June, June of 2022. Hmm. Some time has passed. I don't even, I don't remember what year it is anymore. I think we have been doing this podcast for three years because started during the summer of the pandemic, which is when all podcasts started. Anyway, this is the Unspeakable Podcast. If you want to hear the bonus portion of this conversation, you know what to do. Become a paying subscriber at megandown.substack.com. Also, I forgot to mention this at the top. How is that even possible? The next Unspeakeasy retreat is in Austin, Texas. It is coming up very soon, and it is going to have a very special guest speaker, Bridget Bettesey, writer, journalist, podcaster, YouTuber, thought criminal extraordinaire. She will be joining us to uh, talk about all kinds of things. So if you want to get in on that, go to the unspeakeasy.com. That's June 24th, 25th, weekend long, daytime only on Speakeasy Retreat in Austin. And uh, if that's not going to work for you, I would urge you to join the online Unspeakeasy community, which is really so great. I'm not just saying that. It has just turned out really, really well. An incredible place to be. So check it out, theunspeakeasy.com. We can't really tell you what's going on in there, but there's a pretty comprehensive explainer of what it's all about if you go to the website. This is the Unspeakable Podcast. If I didn't say that before, I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you.